Good day YouTube, this is Warbles on a lot here. What we've got is Michael Cathcart interviewing Major General John Cantwell. Regarding his experience in the Australian Army, and failing the he was there for 30, 33 years. Um, and and cheering like some kind of thing. Pretty sure when Australia was in Iraq, he was in charge of it. That was a very exciting time. But the plan to use the, the bulldozer blades on the front of tanks was explained to me shortly before we kicked off. I was attached to the Americans at that stage. And I did say, you know, it's a bit, bit uh, brutal to the fellow who was briefing me, a senior officer in the, uh, in the American organisation to which I was attached. And, uh, his explanation was very um, straightforward uh, and a pretty tough calculus. He said, look, a bullet or a bulldozer blade, it just doesn't matter as long as we're saving American lives. And I guess if you really, you know, get down to it, it doesn't matter how you get killed, but I didn't feel well or right about that. And um, the, the reason I brought it up was because this way of burying the enemy mm. in their trenches leads you to a site that, that will haunt you to this day that will be a source of countless nightmares for you. What John sees after a day of intense combat is a hand jutting out of the sand. It looks like it's reaching out, it looks like it's moving, it looks like possibly someone is alive under the sand. You're not sure whether it's moving or not. T tell us about that because... ABC like Radio National. Day, doesn't it? it, it was, um, it was one of those peculiar, tiny This is the general in who's in charge of the forces that brought those down. Hands of violence and death. Uh, the, the, the quantity of munitions, um, rockets, uh, aircraft bombs, missiles and artillery that had been fired this is the first into Iraq this war, area. 1991. Was, as I said, um, the attack by the tank formations and cannon fire from the other arm of the vehicle. George Herbert Walker Bush's so the Iraq War. was pretty, you know, full on. It was a brutal place to be. Um, and, and Robert yet in the middle of the Lee Hawks, one Iraq War. Sort of stuck in my soul in a way that I didn't understand then and don't particularly understand well now. I just know that it did happen. And we were moving from one position on the battlefield to another. As I said, there was any number of ugly scenes, left or right. But we just happened to pass one of the trenches that we had, uh, or the Americans had finished bulldozing in. Uh, and the trench probably contained several hundred Iraqis. Um, but in the trench system, not just that one trench. And his hand was protruding from the sand, and it just caught my eye. And the, the, the ugliness of that, the, um, the brutal, um, uncaring nature of that, that that death and the potential that this person had been alive at the time they were buried just just stuck a little little hook into me and um, and even at the time I, I just thought you know what I'm never going to forget that and then we went on to other things and 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 although the days following because it was a short war were were filled with one event after another after another all of which were in their own way quite quite uh, horrifying uh, and frightening. This was the one that started this, this activity, and you're right. Um, and I couldn't talk about it for a long, long time after. It's not for, for a long time. The great strength of the book is we think about war, those of us who are never going to fight it, and hopefully never going to see it, as thousands and thousands of anonymous casualties. We feel obviously sorry for them, we can relate to the, to the destruction, but what your book makes us understand is that every life is a, is a life that is lost, even, even I think actually some of the enemy. Yes. And there's one point when you're crossing the desert by tank and you come across some Iraqis dead from combat, just massacred in the desert, including one who's been decapitated. Now, in the midst of all this mayhem, you go over, you pick up the head, of this decapitated body, you find the torso and you rest the head next to the torso. This is a grisly and really unnecessary action. Why do you take it? Yes. Um, uh, it gets a bit like my reaction to seeing the buried, uh, you know, the, the, the extremity of that buried.
of Iraqi. Um, I don't fully understand why. But it seemed to me that in such a, uh, a mess that there was a little space for some humanity. And uh, we, had, we, were, we were well out from our own fighting uh, troops at that stage. I was being sent off about 50 kilometres to the north to try to hook up with some Americans to coordinate a, a larger attack. And um, we came across this truck that had been blown up, and uh, there were a number of bodies lying around, and I thought I saw one of them move. And so it seemed absolutely necessary to check if there were any wounded. And when we got there, it was quite clear that there was no one alive. What I had seen was a, a piece of cloth flapping in the breeze. Um, uh, and there was, there was four bodies around this truck, and uh, in fact there were uh, a couple of them decapitated. Mm. Something strange happens in the middle of high explosions that mm. plucks the heads from the human body, I don't know why. Um, they'd been blown up by an air, an air, air fire missile of some sort. And uh, it was pretty horrible, but it just seemed to me that this little vignette of death um, could be resolved more humanely. Uh, there would have been thousands and thousands of similar little um, uh, scenarios scattered around that desert. Uh, the Air Force, you might recall, had been bombing the daylights over the Iraq. 33 the years this man made started. his so living. At some point, some battlefield clearance team now he gets a pension. And, this thing. and uh, I just hoped that... Uh, Practicing with the be able to death machines um, in times of the, peace uh, the and praying for a war so he could separate. test his bravery. And, uh, uh, against his, his own fears. It's one of those events that I feel was... And he was um, the general in command of Australian the forces mm. in the first Iraq war. It, it troubles me a little, but... Um, well... And to this extent that I had told... Actually, it was no not Australia's and first and Iraq war. The first time Australians fought in Iraq was in 1918. It troubles you because... At the Battle of Har Magadon. troubles you because of... When the Australian Imperial Forces won Armageddon. Because the motivation is, as you say, it is. Go and check your history books. Hell, some Australia won the Battle of Armageddon in 1918. Try the Seven the Pillars of Wisdom by T.E. Lawrence. Um, he explains it. Look, it was at the end of uh, a period of quite high tension. It was, uh, we were very much alone. Uh, I had two young British soldiers under my command on my vehicle. They were rather perturbed. Um, we were certainly hanging in the breeze uh, in a dangerous situation and to take the time to do a trouble them uh, as well. Uh, they kept shouting me, come on boss, come on, get back on the vehicle. But it seemed important. And um, um, one of, the, one of the, the decapitated heads was and when I turned around, um, at first I saw this lump in the sand, then I saw another one, and I realised what that was. When I walked towards one, it was staring back at me. And there'd been a little shower of rain, and despite the fact that there were sandstorms, intermittently, the shower of rain had washed from the eyes of this, this, mm. uh, this poor dead Iraqi. And, um, Pretty sure I used to know this bloke's sandstorm. mother. Um, uh, and His and mother was a friend of my mother. Not something you, you do every day, and nor would you want to. And uh, it, uh, I've never the met him. The sensation of doing it um, is one that I have not forgotten. And uh, even talking about it now, I can, mm. I can, I can feel the weight of it and the swing of it, and I can feel that uh, that uh, sand sting in my face as we did it. So yeah, it's a memory that has stayed. It's one form of, of horror. Uh, another form of totally different, I suppose. Fear is how, I, is how I would see it. You, at one stage, you describe you've got a column of tanks heading across the desert, uh, and you hit a section that's riddled with mines. And you can't really move the tanks. Did you, you just you, go you, in you, and you play the camera. Start, you come to a halt. You have to find a way through these little bombers. Little Back into the uh, 240 volt power you supply. The tank, take to your feet and walk around, trying to figure out the best way for the tanks to go. And in fact, you do this a bit. You get out of the tank and walk around the mine. And that must be just nerve shattering. Or stupid. Yeah. Um, uh, look, yes, the, the event that you described occurred very early in the course when we were breaking into Iraqi mines and bringing the British tanks through. Um, there had been a, some sort of mistake. I was in charge of part of the, um, the crossing area. 
England who was responsible for getting several thousand tanks and other vehicles through these narrow lanes, through the minefields. Something went wrong, there was a, there was a, a, a breakdown, and uh, it was essential to get this thing going. And the only way to do it was to take one part of the column and take it across to another cleared lane. But in the middle, unfortunately, we're there were lots and lots of uh, deliberately laid anti-tank, anti-personnel lines and a sprinkling of these cluster bomblets that had been dropped by um, artillery and by aircraft. So uh, the only way to do it was to do, uh, to do what I did, was to get on my feet and, and lead the, the tank column across. And um, uh, it, it was a difficult ex activity. Um, I bet. Had to be done. Um, and uh, I was very pleased when I arrived at the other lane with the I was attached. Yes, indeed. The operation you commanded in Iraq, the, the first Gulf War, was deemed a success. You came back home, not surprising from what we've all heard tonight, you were beset with terrible nightmares. You started to battle these demons, your anger fluctuated when you were uh, at home. I think you visit for the first time a psychiatrist in your first impact at a, at a Melbourne hospital. Is this when you first realised that you've got post-traumatic stress disorder? Did you get a diagnosis no. around this time or not? No, I didn't. Uh, I didn't have a clue what was wrong. Um, it was a very troubling and confusing time. Um, here I was, a professional soldier, uh, in my thirties, um, middle-ranking major, middle-ranking officer in the rank of major, uh, and I expected that I would Whoopsie. come home for more, um, you know, uh, satisfied... He retired and, uh, as a general. ...pleased with how things had gone. And I was, to an extent, you know, I did the things that I needed to do and uh, didn't, didn't let myself down or my team down. But I started having these nightmares and, and, uh, and displaying many of the, uh, the attributes of uh, post-traumatic stress disorder that I now know full well um, are, are quite often the case, you know, jumping at loud noises, nightmares, flashbacks, um, feeling distant from loved ones, um, irrational anger, um, uh, a, a sense of uh, irrelevance of everything around, and uh, and I was quite troubled. I was picked up by um, uh, my commanding officer. Uh, no one else asked ever asked me if I was okay. And this is months after I'd come home, because mm. the army had forgotten everything they ever knew about post-traumatic stress as a result of combat. You know, the Vietnam vets um, uh, had had suffered this, and. Mm. Yet somehow the army just gone, go, okay, well, you, you had a bit of a war, well done you, get back to work, here's a memo, fill it out. Um, and, uh, it's a so terrible indictment, isn't it? Well, yeah. we were just naive. The system, the organisation was completely naive. And there were so few of us involved in combat. Mm. Um, so look, it was an odd time. I was an odd boy. I was, I was a very rare uh, fish. I was a soldier with recent contemporary combat experience. And we, the Australian Army hadn't had that uh, mm. for 15 years or so. Um, and uh, my first bit of treatment was poorly managed. I was dismissed by a, a Tweedy psychiatrist at a Melbourne um, institution as an Oongra, who then advised me that the best course of action was to think happy thoughts. Yeah. Um, and uh, and uh, it all would be well. And, uh, which, and which in turn must have made you feel suspicious what of going back shit. to seek that type of help. It did. How it was insulting. Have said and, that to um, and I didn't go back for a long time. Uh, and only when I really started to struggle, uh, I finally got a little bit of counselling. And that was okay in terms of its uh, effect. But I, I was never really signed up for it because I was never signed up to the fact that I had anything wrong with me. Mm. I didn't understand that there was a problem. Mm. Uh, I was clearly having a problem. I simply was unable to admit to myself that I was having a problem. Mm. And, um, and I just f failed to do the thing that must be done in that situation is to get some help. I failed to do that. And I didn't do it for another 20 years. You're clearly disturbed by what you've seen in your first combat tour to Iraq, but incredibly, you go back to Iraq again for the second Gulf War. Should you have gone back? Um, yes. Uh, for, the, for, for the reason, firstly, that I was still a professional soldier. He was uh, addicted to were involved it. in that war, and I had visited Iraq a he couple of times. He was a fully paid um, up, true believing warrior um, cult And in a peculiar Despite way, the difficulty. Again, perhaps naive, I had a notion that I could perhaps do some good, because we, you know, we were trying to help the Iraqis, trying to get this. Why do you think the Second World War veterans um, enlisted for Korea? Uh, uh, Why do you think the Korean vets? 
went to Vietnam. A, a foolish notion. But that was Why the did the Vietnam vets um, run away to Granada? With this view that I could indeed do some good, and in a, in a, in a, um, a very boyish way, I guess I thought I could survivor re guilt repay some of the death and destruction that I had survivor participated in. guilt uh, make some amends in my earlier earlier See? war against the Iraqis. This is the first time I've heard this interview. Major General John Campbell, so author easy. of Exit Wounds, speaking with me at the Avid Reader Bookstore in Brisbane. You're listening to Big Ideas on RN or abc.net.au slash Radio National. Paul Barclay with you. You can Paul Barclay, not Michael Casca. Oops. By visiting understand. our website and you can follow us on Twitter at RN Big Ideas. John Cantwell's post-traumatic stress disorder gradually got worse and worse over 20 years until eventually he was admitted to a psychiatric hospital when he returned to Australia from Afghanistan. <laughs> he describes it as falling off a cliff. John Cantwell. I had accumulated these terrible memories in, in three different wars for different reasons. Uh, in the first Gulf War, as a, as a combat soldier, seeing firsthand what combat does and being involved in, 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 in deadly activity. In the second exposure, I was one removed or several removed from the fighting, but by sheer chance, found myself at the wrong place at the wrong time on several occasions when uh, I saw just how terrible things could be for the average Iraqi citizens, and I saw wholesale death and destruction at a time when the Iraqis were busy killing themselves at a rate of 3,000 a month uh, in a sectarian violence when 100 or more coalition soldiers were being killed every month. Um, I ended up in as I said, the wrong place, and perhaps we'll, we can touch on that later if you wish. But mm. um, uh, it was a very tough uh, time, and it, it, it added a couple more layers of hurt, more bad memories, um, more nightmares, you know, and, uh, and then again in, uh, in Afghanistan, although um, again in a much different role as a national commander. Um, uh, the loss of the soldiers that uh, died, the 10 soldiers that died when I was the national commander, mm. and the 64 who were wounded, many of them grievously, in life-changing ways. That all added up. Mm. And so there was this long, slow accumulation, and I knew um, a number of years before I went to Afghanistan that I was having some problems, and I had a name for this post-traumatic stress disorder mm. uh, by this time. I knew something about it, but I was still in denial. I thought, I look like it. I read, I'll, I'll beat this. Um, but regrettably, I was wrong, and um, at a point pretty soon after I made the decision that I could not be seriously in contention to be the Chief of Army, and by the way, I don't think I would have got it anyway, no? uh, but the current man uh, is a very good friend of mine, David Morrison, I would have chosen David, um, he, he, he is the man for the job. But I was in, you know, nice, a, a close second, in the running, I would have got a, got a ribbon, you know, and a, and a little sort of you know, silver star or something. Um, uh, but it, it, I just couldn't do it. I, I seriously could not be considered. And it was troubling me that just by sh some quirk that I might have got the job. You know, I was a recently returned combat the commander, blah, blah, blah. I didn't want to uh, inflict my inability to give it 100% on the soldiers who deserved the best leadership. But possible. the fact is, you are functioning at such a high level, despite these demons, such a high level, that you are in the running for the top job. How much was what you were experiencing emotionally affecting your work? Yeah, it's a, that's a really good question. Um, but I, I became a very, very good actor. Um, uh, and I also became very good at compartmenting my emotions and my day-to-day -day activities. Um, it was quite normal for Jane I and I to feel really sorry for this yet another night of nightmares. Some of them really violent, which would see me springing out of bed, gasping, yelling, thrashing my arms about, um, even throwing Jane into a corner to protect her from some phantom, um, and then driving to work in the morning, parking in the car park in Russell offices, which is the main defence headquarters in Canberra, and literally blubbing away for about five or ten minutes because my emotions were just all over the place, and I was still trying to shed the, the ashes of this terrible night of, mm. of nightmares and, and so on. Um, but then I would give myself a, a slapping, uh, dry my eyes, take a couple of deep breaths, and become the person that I needed to be to, to continue with my career. Mm. Put on my happy face, mm. tell jokes, uh, lead, command people, make good decisions. Mm. Um, and, Seek uh, hail! And, and I did it, uh, I think, mm. reasonably well. Baffle um, is baffle. Uh, orders and, are and orders. No one knew that there was a problem. The 
chief of the army when I was the deputy chief of the army, uh, General Peter Lay. Be him last prepared year about my problems and the fact that I was going to Boy Scouts. He was flabbergasted. He, he had no idea. Fucking British um, Boy Scouts. Like, Look what um, it's done to us all. And rightly so. I said, well, why didn't you tell me? Been, we had been friends as well as my boss for many, many years. Said, why didn't you tell me? Mm. My mum and dad have asked me the same question. Why didn't you tell us? Well, mm. I didn't want to disclose it. I felt mm. weak. I felt, mm. I felt ashamed. I felt mm. as though I had failed um, to contain my emotions. I've got to say, uh, as I I've picked up the pieces from 1914 to 1984. I thought, I can solve this problem. You know, just this guy problem, got it. his first combat and experience six years after I left on my own. I was the Repatriation so General Hospital Veterans Affairs System. Having a mental illness, uh, confessing to having emotional problems caused by combat, which was the case for you, is that seen as weakness in the Army? Um, I hope not. Um, the, the weakness component is that uh, quite incorrect belief among some who suffer from combat-related stress and stress from other uh, horrendous events. There's sort of belief that there must be something wrong with me if I feel this way. Why can't I just cop this on the chin? Why, why is this upsetting me? Why am I having these bad dreams? And obviously, I'm, I'm some sort of weak person. Uh, I should be better than this, and particularly a combat officer like myself. We are infused with this idea of self-belief, mm. an image, a self-image of a warrior, someone who wins, fights, gets things done. And uh, the same would apply to a police officer, an ambo. You know, they, they, they want to succeed, they want to save the patient, they want to stop the crime. Soldiers believe they can win battles. Every battle, including the one inside your heart and inside your mind. And it's also a macho culture. It is. It's that you're operating within Look, as well. it's, it's, it's not, this is certainly not a male-only domain. Absolutely not. But the truth is that the, a significant portion of those that we send into the most brutal aspects of combat are young males. That's mm. just the way it is at the moment. That may change. Um, but right now, that's the way it is. And, and they are... Uh, of all those we might expose, perhaps the group most likely to deny they've got a problem because they are the young, bulletproof male. Mm. And males don't, as a general rule, tell how they feel. They don't want to be seen to have any problems. And in, in an organisation like the Army, where mental and physical toughness is praised and instilled and sought after, any information to admit that you've got a problem is, is very hard to to bring out into the open. So it is, it is as much a battle to get people to say... Last bits of firewood. And, and I was, I fell into that same trap. And I wanted to get out, as, if I can't be in the army and serve our soldiers anymore, in that way, mm. I wanted to serve our soldiers, sailors and airmen and others, by saying, look, learn from my stupidity, my, my mistake of trying to bury this and not to help properly for 20 years. I hope, my dear subscribers, you have got the gist of Major General John Campbell's message. I'm incredibly fortunate because Jane and I have a relationship which has transcended all of these problems. Mm. And if it not for Jane, I, I don't know where I would be. So no, what he says is uh, his wife puts so up with him beating her up in the some, middle of the night any cases, while he's fighting with the nightmares down. Mm. the in three the wars that he's fought. Confusion and anger, misdirected anger. Mm. Um, and this uh, is a major general. Loss of emotional engagement, the things that are part of post-traumatic stress mm. disorder. Imagine what it's we like. touched on some of the terrible things you've seen. For the colonels, the captains, the, the majors, the lieutenants, the, actually, the, the, the sergeants, the corporals and but the privates. But you were also the commander of Australian troops in Afghanistan and the buck stopped with you and during your time, <coughs> ten diggers, I think, it was ten was the number that right. died. It was a it was a shocking time for Australia in Afghanistan in 2010. It wasn't your fault, obviously, but you were unable to shake responsibility for it. You carried a huge weight of responsibility for those deaths. Um, mm. Have you been able to shake free of that responsibility? Because clearly it isn't your fault, but you, you, you really felt like it was, in a sense. Um, no, I haven't broken free of that. I don't think I ever will. Um, you're right in so far as um, the, the circumstances that led to the, the battery state of the battery. Of direct control. On the camera. But I was nonetheless the 
station. Still running. I was ultimately responsible for their safety, for sending them home. I 25 minutes. Uh, I did everything in my power to try to make that happen by ensuring we had the right equipment and the techniques were okay and synchronising our operations to the best effect and making sure we weren't doing dangerous, unnecessary activities, uh, that we weren't taking unnecessary risks in trying to achieve our missions. But at the end of the day, um, I was the boss. And in this day and age, the idea of accountability, responsibility, is a very slippery one. It's very easy for people these days to just duck and slide and go, it's not my fault, uh, the, the society made me do it. Um, oh, it's because I was bullied at school. Um, and I'm not diminishing those, mm. those um, aspects that, that play on people's minds. Um, but at the end of the day, someone is accountable. Someone made the decision. Someone is the boss who must accept that. And I have lived by this code for all of my working life. And, and it is impossible for me to put that down. You are also at war, though. And I think you also make the point, war is lottery. You know, when your numbers war. come up, there's really not much you can do about w it. So yes, sure, a a a u g h Whoa! It's a noise primates make when they're, they're hungry or wrong. angry Personal. enough to kill yes, that's another correct. primate. Um, look, it's, there's, there's two a state of war exists. And there's the emotional need. <coughs> John, and this Major one, General he, Monkey, uh, goes, uh, with no, the three of them. Well, you, you, you one of them, he was in command of the task force. Um, and bad things happen in war. Okay, get over it. That's the intellectual side. The emotional yeah, handle goes, on, um, it's not as easy as that, mate. And, uh, and I, can't, I can't just extinguish that emotional nag. And uh, are, you, are you easier on yourself now than you were? Uh, I've, been, I've been told I need to be so. Um, certainly writing this book has helped me in, in quite important ways. Yeah, one of the techniques that's used in, in counselling and management of this issue is exposure therapy. We are exposed to sort of controlled environment threatening activities. Well, we've been writing it down. Well, I've done the extreme sports version of you know, mm. the business and, and written a book about it. And it was a deeply difficult emotional journey. Um, the writing came surprisingly easy, but the, the emotional process of re-emerging, sorry, re-immersing myself in these experiences, because I needed to do that so that I could remember them fully. And I remember I've been trying to suppress these for 20 years, so that was a bit tough. You, you, um, you, you, but it, it was good for me in the end, I think. But you identify some of these bodies in the mortuary, don't you? You take it upon mm. yourself to go in and make the official identification of, of most of, or of many of the bodies. All of the, uh, the ten, yes. Um, this was a pact that I made with myself. You might recall there was a terrible blunder occurred um, when uh, a young Australian soldier named Private Jay Colco mm. was killed accidentally in, uh, in Baghdad. Um, and they made a complete hash of turning his body into Australia. It was, it was, a, it was a shameful thing. Mm. Um, and I won't delve into the details of it, but it should never have occurred. And it was so hurtful to the parents who, I must tell you, I met only uh, a week or so ago. They came to one of my talks and um, they are still in, uh, in a devastated state, particularly his mother, uh, over that. And uh, I swore to myself that that would never happen on my watch. Mm. I was in Baghdad when that happened, but I was working with the Americans. Um, and I shared the shit. Shit, I'm glad I got that. Australian servicemen and women in Baghdad, in Iraq, at that time. And I said, look, that's not going to happen. And so I made a point of, when we started losing soldiers, and we lost 10 in the space of only about three months, a very compressed period, that's not going to happen. And so I ensured we had the processes absolutely right. And one of those steps, uh, in addition to the professionals, like the doctors and the military policemen, who had the coronial responsibility to ensure that the human remains are properly identified and managed, I also said, I will personally identify those remains mm. and ensure that they are the right ones mm. going in the right casket yeah, it just seemed. the right family. Mm. And that came at some cost, um, but it's a... Such a, a good story, it might be worthwhile. to flinch, and, and then proud that I did, mm. um, it was unpleasant. Back because regrettably, 
not always were the worms from the bullet, which is usually fairly clean. The, uh, mm. uh, the, some of the worms were, were, were just ghastly and catastrophic. Um, and uh, that, was, that was a tough thing, not just for me, but for all those involved in the process. But it meant that I could, um, I could say goodbye personally. I did that. I placed my hand on I'm taking advantage. the body or, or that which I could place a hand on. Of the of unlimited upload. And I the said passive. goodbye. And I said, I'm sorry that you've been killed. And, uh, but we're taking care of you and you're on your way home. Mm. And uh, you'll never be alone and, uh, until you are reunited with your family. And I said goodbye, mate. Warrior and, spiritual uh, religious goodbye, Jake, rituals. Goodbye, Darren. Goodbye, all the other soldiers. Um, who were all listed in the in the front of the book, actually. Yes. Uh, yeah. Um, and I'll tell you one other thing about yeah. that. Um, a, a number of the families who I showed the manuscript to before the book was published, to those whose loved ones were killed, have come to me and said, because of the terrible effects of the, the explosion normally, or other thing that killed their loved one, they couldn't view the remains and say goodbye the way they wanted to. And they said, at least someone that we know and trust said goodbye for us, and they will always be grateful for that. So, although it carried little cost, it was certainly a duty I'm glad I did, and, um, and uh, would never have it any other way. Is there anything worse than receiving one of those phone calls to inform you that one of your troops has died? You, you, you describe it as almost a physical blow yeah, when that news so comes through. It was, uh, it was really shocking, particularly as they started to accumulate, one after another. And indeed, we were conducting the funeral for one soldier, the farewell, not the funeral, the, the farewell ceremony, memorial ceremony, for, for, um, uh, for some of the soldiers when I was called aside to say someone else had just been killed. Mm. Um, it just kept coming as a hammer blow uh, to everyone, to the whole organisation. And it's a tremendous credit to the resilience and emotional strength and leadership and cohesion of, of the forces that we send overseas, who just do us so proud. Um, but they, they were able to withstand these shocks and and persist and keep doing the duty that we sent them to do, no matter what. And uh, it's, uh, it's a great credit to all of our people. But nonetheless, it was a tough time. And there speaks a true those, believer. Uh, I shared a lot of tears. Yes, it's a I pacifist. I shared a lot of tears in those days. And, um, so most of those were in private, but occasionally He sent young Australians to war. Um, they were uh, sad I picked up and John patched up to you, though, and what's left you afterwards. You were proud of being a soldier, and as you said at the beginning of, of the talk, um, you're proud of the time you spent in the army. Uh, a lot of people might find it hard to understand how, given what you've experienced, you can feel that way. But do you think you get addicted to war? Do you think you get addicted to the adrenaline? Of war, did you did you feel that? Not me personally, um, particularly as we started to lose soldiers. I always felt a great sense of um, uh, responsibility to try to make them safe, keep mm. them safe. And with each well, passing, the check. With each new death or deaths, um, my my Still anxiety running. about the welfare increased. So now I wasn't I wasn't getting some sort of buzz out of that. But I can tell you though that having been in a in a few, you know, fights, um, when I was a younger guy and knowing a number of soldiers, special forces soldiers, soldiers in our conventional infantry and other other components of our force, um, there is a bit of a rush to it. Mm. Um, uh, but the rush is only it's a bit like the you know the sugar hit. It only lasts a little while. Mm. And not not everyone, but most people then carry away a much more enduring legacy, and that is the memory of what has been done, what they've seen happen, what they have done themselves to others, and that's the legacy that troubles people with down the years, and uh, is much more enduring than the, than the transient rush that you do get. There is a sense of great passion and excitement, and, and let's get on with this, boys. It's, it's, uh, it's a really a potent drug, but it, it doesn't last. You are understandably deeply troubled by the deaths of the Australian troops under your command. And this is a, this is a, you know, a pretty responsibility to bear, but what about the civilian deaths of those on the other side? Uh, can you spend much time thinking about the, mm -hmm. the Iraqis and the Afghans who, who died? Oh, yeah. 
Um, a great deal. A great deal. Um, in Baghdad in 2006, uh, a terrible year to be in Iraq. The sectarian violence has been ignited by the destruction of a very sacred Shia holy site in February of 2006. And that most really just opened the gates for the terrible sectarian violence that, that flowed through that year and continues even now. Um, and I had made some friends, many friends in Iraqi uh, Defence Forces. Um, I got out and around with, with a number of Iraqis. I tried my best to save a young man, find a young man, an Iraqi boy, who had been kidnapped and who was probably That's right. right. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and on one terrible day, I happened to be in the market, or near a marketplace, full of women and kids. It was uh, attacked by a car stacked with mm -hmm. explosives and, and killed many, many women and children. And I was amongst them. I was the first on the scene. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I will never forget that, that experience, uh, mm -hmm. particularly seeing, um, as I did, a little sort of uh, pink mm -hmm. sandals floating in a puddle of blood. And, uh, and only when I turned to look at the wall behind me, which I had seen had this peculiar smudge shape on it before I, I really saw the sandals that dawned on me. That was the body print of this young girl, mm -hmm. just a little, little toddler. Um, so yeah, I think a lot about those. I think about the Afghans, who are, who are good people, mm -hmm. who are, are simple, um, proud um, people with a deep culture and a great um, independence. And I spent a lot of time sipping tea and eating um, uh, chickpeas and, mm -hmm. and crunching on uh, almonds in villages and in meetings and uh, really admired the people who endure such such a, a brutal physical environment, and then overlay on top of that the decades of war that they've endured. Mm. Um, uh, you know, you can't help but feel sorry for them. And so, yeah, I do think about them. I've been thinking about them a lot. But um, I guess um, it's natural that I thought most about the soldiers I was directly responsible for. And, and, uh, uh, and although it sounds a bit harsh, I, I would consider, I think about them, the diggers more than the sure. others. That's a little, um, a little casual of me to say that. That's, that's the truth. Do you come out the other end thinking that war is utterly futile? Or do you think there is a reason for it and a justification for it? Mm. Uh, I've given us a lot of thought. Uh, regrettably, we as a species have not evolved so far as the rules that we've stopped killing each other on a regular basis. Humans, regrettably, as a, as a, as a group, have that hardwired into us, it seems. I wish it wasn't so. But regrettably, there are people in the world whose hearts are filled with hate. There are self-interested uh, dictators. There are despots and murderers. So he just wants to be paid to kill them. See violence as a legitimate component of their uh, philosophy of uh, getting things done. And, and he doesn't the case, see it. Be the need, just as there's a need for How much violence did he employ? Just enough to win. Sometimes step up and. He only employed enough violence to win. I wish we didn't have to do that. There is a saying to uh, a lady I uh, met uh, just in the group, um, Annette, uh, who... Uh, who was so he's still a true believer. Seeing what on that, it's a very apt line. Um, seeing what happens in war is, is, uh, it can only revolt any thinking in the day. Um, and uh, so, look, I wish we didn't have wars. But I, All I can say uh, is... That. Maybe if his children were the ones who were dying in the war, then perhaps he would take the lesson. But at the moment, he appears to be resisting the hook. In the United States, 6,500 veteran suicides were recorded in 2011. The suicide rate is now 25 times higher than the fatality rate on the battlefield. In other words, war may be hell, and combat may kill and maim people, but many, many, many more soldiers are taking their own lives when they return home. It's a ghastly society. Um, I, I was Isn't that a classic? Study in Australia, and 25 I, I times no the battlefield that death rate claimed by suicide after the war. Um, just today, I was at a book signing in another part of the city. People say I'm fucking I mad for being a pacifist. Uh, a fellow who served, who worked for me, served with me in Afghanistan, and he is recovering from a self-harm incident. Um, 
and he uh, he's not sure if he's ever going to not have another cr another crack. Um, it's a it is the component of the results being exposed to terrible trauma that is as deadly as that bullet on the battlefield or the uh, the roadside bomb, and it is. It is more the downstream um, consequences of no one that you've done the wrong thing. It's invisible. It's often denied. Um, no one you don't deserve to live. Many of those who are most prone to it, by your own estimation, least inclined to seek assistance and help. Um, even those who do, um, there is this quite profound. Why do you think um, the suicide the, the death rate is five times the road toll in Australia? Will sweep them off the edge of the abyss and. Uh, I well understand those dark thoughts. It mm. can be very difficult to see a way out of this, and um, uh, as why intervention by professionals early is so important. But the first step, of course, is to admit you have a problem, mm. and admit, and then then having done that, do something about it. There's admitting that you have a problem, and you've made a very good case for that. But is there anything the army can do to prepare people for what they're about to experience, mm. or can you only ever? imagine that after you've been there. Um, the Army and, and Defence generally now is much more attuned to the issues about mental health than it was, even a few years ago. Um, they've got much better. The system is not perfect, but it's certainly uh, quite robust, and the help is there if people seek it. It is almost impossible, I would judge, to prepare for the shocks that confront you on a battlefield. You just can't replicate that. You can talk about it. Um, there's a risk, of course, if you dwell on it too much, that you'll, you'll suggest this to people. Uh, there's a balance to be struck between suggesting and, and, and letting them discover it on their own. Um, what is important is for those who are exposed to being told that, look, okay, you've seen some tough things. Be aware that this is a little bit of a scar on the soul. Uh, it's perfectly normal. It's perfectly normal to see bad things, abnormal things and have this reaction. That's the first thing to tell people, so they don't feel as I did for so many years. It's perfectly normal, matey. I remember it. You know, it's wrong with me. Well, I do, this? being um, three years old, and, putting and a steel blade through a two-year-old baby's I've head. Got, got it's perfectly you. normal, um, matey. Resolve this mental issue. Here was, particularly after the first Gulf War, I've been at war for four days, well, look at the guys who served in Vietnam, mm. Korea, Second World War, First World War, years away. And he, he was me blubbing in my, in my you know, mm -hmm. cereal um, of a morning, you know, uh, oh, so I felt like a fool. Yeah. Well, you've got to get past that, and then the messaging has to be about being aware this is going to affect you, perhaps it's okay to feel affected, and if it does affect you, we'll get some help. You've got a sore knee, you can't see a knee doctor, you know, you've got a sore mind, you can't see a mind doctor. <laughs> Ah, you know, uh, oh, you've got a sore mind. Go and see a mind doctor. <laughs> Good I luck, mate. Afghanistan, Australia is still at war in Afghanistan. A majority of Australians don't support the war mm -hmm. in Afghanistan and our involvement in it. Both major political parties do. Don't even really want to talk about it. No. You now have the view that the war is not achieving anything and that the price we've paid is too high, way too high. Oh, I'm glad. This has been the most controversial thing you've said, I think, since the book came out, that you no longer support this campaign. That must be a bitter truth for you to accept. Um, I, I will reshape your description of my, my view a little, yeah, but only a little. Um, I, I don't... I, I would disagree that, um, that I have portrayed the word not achieving anything. Things are being achieved. Mm -hmm. um, schooling is better in our know, guard. People are getting to health things. Um, there is slightly better uh, governance. Um, the life expectancy has improved. Yeah, those things are measurable and they have been achieved at uh, a terrible cost, but through ingenuity and courage and limit and fantastic hard work by a lot of Australians mm. and many other coalition nations. Mm -hmm. But as you quite rightly said, it's the price that we pay for that. You know, is the fact that a road has now been opened um, up the Chora Valley, say, in Oregon province. I mean, that's great. It means people can get their food to market. They can get the things they need. They can get to the schools. Um, the plight of women and girls 
has marginally improved. Um, but is it worth 38 lives? This is the, the, the distinction that I make. We have achieved some things. The soldiers have not died in vain. They died doing what they love to do, with their mates, doing a job which is honourable. Absolutely. What could be more honourable than fighting for your country alongside your mates? In um, absurdist day. To do good. I mean, they know Australia. To keep the mayor of Kabul country. pretending that he's the president. They believe we're doing something good, and we are trying to. But trying I, to. I understand all that. I get that. But what I, the heart of me, the intellect, understands the first argument, the emotional me, just as I stood and looked at those men in that military facility, and knowing that they were the husband, the father, the son, the brother, the fiancé, the much-loved person who had a life still to live, and here they were dead, and here was their family receiving them soon, and their lives were going to be never the same. The price we pay is too high. It's too high for what we've achieved, is like, what you're saying. Yes, and, you know, much as I admire the Afghan people and, and our, our purpose in going there initially was, was just in the wake of the, the terrorist attacks on the West, but we've drifted into a, a nation-building and democratisation process, which is honourable and good, mm. but is it worth the lives of Australians? And that's the discussion. I've heard it suggested, uh, questioned perhaps, whether you're in the right state to make that judgment, mm. and secondly, even if you do believe it, whether you should publicly mm. enunciate those views. Yeah. Yes, I read that article too. Um, I, I would reject it uh, completely. Um, it's quite reasonable to say, but I'll ask the question, um, have my emotional uh, difficulties clouded my judgment and placed me in a position where that judgment is impaired? I reject that, absolutely. Um, I haven't, I, uh, what I have is, is bad memories. Um, which affect me in profound ways, but for which I am now finally getting treatment and getting better. Yeah. It hasn't you know, decreased my IQ. It, it, hasn't, it hasn't made me stupid. And in fact, if anything, it has sharpened my perception of issues. Um, so I, I reject that first comment. Um, and I particularly uh, reject and object to the idea that someone like me with a little bit of status and some experience and, and, and a platform to speak from should shut up mm. about profoundly important issues mm. um, and particularly for that criticism to come from uh, uh, someone in the media who would, would cry from the rooftops if we suggest that they shouldn't discuss important issues. If anyone should speak up, it should be those who have been involved, who have, a, who have a, a, some skin in the game, mm. who have lost a bit of skin whose friends and colleagues and subordinates and people that they are entrusted to care for lost their lives and their limbs and their spirits have been damaged. If, if someone like me who can't speak up, well, he can. Yeah. And, and I should, and I must, and I will. One thing that's not in the book, you don't have much time for the Defence Minister, Stephen Smith, do you? Um, He's not on your Christmas card list. Well, he, I'm not on his, anyway. Um, Look, uh, he has no respect for those who choose to serve in uniform for their country, you've written. Uh, yeah, that's, um, that's why I say it. Uh, but I'm not going to jump back onto that, that horse. You're not? Um, no. Uh, what led you to that conclusion, if I can just ask you? Well, a, a visit that he made and, um, to Afghanistan. And, uh, and look, all politicians are guilty of this to a greater or lesser extent, no matter what their political stripe. Um, and there is an inclination to sort of get the photograph with the troops and so on. But uh, in that one instance, um, it, it, it was transparently, um, transparently uh, so. And, uh, and uh, look, I, I felt, uh, particularly in the wake of the excoriation that was going on of, the, of a wonderful officer, um, uh, the Commandant of uh, the Defence Academy, who did everything right, you know, bloody ugly, horrible, absolutely unacceptable. The Skype yes. incident, oh, I mean, absolutely abhorrent mm. um, perpetrated by youngsters who have been in the defence realm for five minutes um, but nonetheless 
carried our uniform on their back, and so you know, we, we've topped it on the chin. But um, look, I, I'm not going to dwell on that. Uh, the minister has a very difficult portfolio. Um, uh, he has his own uh, his own code of ethics and beliefs, and uh, and I respect that. Mm -hmm. I have mine, and uh, we'll leave it at that. Retired Army Major General John Campwell, author of Exit Wounds, published by Melbourne University Press. Thanks to Avid Reader Bookstore in Brisbane. That's it for another Big Ideas for today. Remember, you can subscribe to Big Ideas via iTunes or through our website, abc.net.au slash Radio National. And you can tell us what you think while you're there. And you can tweet us at our There you go. Warbles on a lot. The YouTube version of ABC Radio. And like I said, I think my mother taught his mother how to use a sewing machine. In the late 1950s. But I could be wrong, it may be a different Cantwell. Warbles on a lot to YouTube. Ciao.